Our new baby brother was named Walter Evander. He was named for Papa's father. He was a beautiful child, golden hair and great big blue eyes. And of course, we all just adored him. I started to school when he was a very, very tiny baby. Mama had talked to me about school. She told me that I couldn't run all over the place the way I was used to, that I would have to sit in the same seat all the time. I thought that was terrible. But after I got started to school, it wasn't so bad. The teacher let a few of us go in the cloakroom at a, a time and play dolls. I gave Mama some bother over C. I asked her to make C for me. She wrote S double E, and I wouldn't have that. She wrote S E A, and I wouldn't have that. And finally, she kept made me a capital C, and she found out that was what I wanted. I told her that I was the only little girl at school that didn't get to wear their Sunday dress to school every day and their best shoes. And then I told her that I was the only little girl at school that had to help with the dishes at home. That didn't bother her a bit. M President McKinley was shot by Leon Shawgots. The what I had just been going to school a little while. We didn't have any auditorium or cafeteria or any place for the children to gather. So we were all taken to the courthouse, which was nothing but a stone building uptown, and had a memorial service for President Kinley, McKinley. The only thing I can remember about it was that there was a great, big, beautiful American flag on the stage. I had the only sleigh ride in my life about this time. We had a tank in Kwanai. It might have been a pond or it might have been a natural lake, but we called it a tank. And one winter, it froze over so thick that Papa made a little box sled on runners and took Frank and me over there, and we had a ride on the sleigh. Natalie moved across the street from us. And they lived in a rent house when she first came to Quarrel and across the street from her was the Baptist church. I looked over there at Natalie in her yard and I called, come over little girl, but she didn't pay attention to me. Finally she came and she has been in my life ever since. She's the best friend I ever had. She was the most beautiful, charming child I ever knew and I still think that way about her. Frank started his school when he was eight years old. We were supposed to start at seven, but he didn't want to go. So Mama didn't make him go. She taught him some at home. She taught him his letters, and when he was saying his ABCs, he would say, um, when he came to, a to F, he'd call it broken back, and M, he just stopped. He said, Mama, I can't say that, M. His first teacher was Miss Stout. She was a character if one ever lived. She was far from being a young woman. She plaited her hair and tied it with a bow in the back, and she had bangs. And all of her dresses were just alike. All was a black skirt, a light waist with a ruffle around the shoulders, and she was dirty. Mom was much distressed because she thought Frank was the slouchiest child she had, and when she saw that his teacher wasn't neat, she thought it was hopeless. But he grew up to be very nice and particular. Now, in our neighborhood, there was a woman of ill repute. Her husband owned a dray line the Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, second edition, says that a dray is a two-wheel vehicle. But in Kwana, it was a long wagon, and nothing but a floor with wheels on it. But it did have removable sides that could be put up when needed. 
This woman's husband owned two drays, and some the driver of the one dray was her husband, and the other driver was a, a boarder. And he came home when he knew her husband wasn't there, and he just things just weren't right with him. Mama knew that, and she, the woman sent her children down to our house to get rid of her, and Mama didn't like that, of course. But Mama had a real personal grievance against this woman. She borrowed. Mama bought the best brands of coffee and bacon and so on that she could get, and the woman bought the cheapest things. She'd come down there, and want to borrow some flour, some coffee, or something nearly every day. Mom would let her have it. Finally, she decided she'd put up with that long enough. So one day she went over to the lady's house, the woman's house, and she had a list of things that she'd borrowed and hadn't paid back, and she told, Mama told her she'd gone to borrow, and she named over all these things. The woman gave them to her. Mama put them on a shelf at home. And when Mrs. B would come back to borrow, Mama would hand her back her own stuff, and she soon quit borrowing. So Mama did not want to live in that neighborhood bit in the world. So Papa said that it was all right. We'd get us another house. And he did get us a house. It was called the Simpson House because the, we bought it from the Simpsons. It was one of the nicest houses in Cornwall. It wouldn't be called a fine house here or now, but it, it was at that time. We had eight rooms, and we had a bathroom. Doesn't seem like it was really a bathroom because we wanted a drop of water in it. The tub was built in. It was a galvanized iron, I guess that's what it was, some kind of metal. The cistern was on the back porch, and we'd fill the tub with water, and we'd have a good time splashing in that. The cistern was one of the lights of the place, because you remember I told you when we bought the fuel house, Mom was so happy that she could go just in the backyard to few steps and get the water, well, well water, but the cistern was right on an enclosed back porch, and that was just about like having water in the house. Of course, though, you, you had to pump it, and you turned the crank, brought the water up that way. We had a windmill, windmill tower, and a trough that was for the livestock to drink. We had hydrants in our yard and got water out in the yard when we needed to. We had a hitching post in front of the house. It was two iron bars with a iron tube between them. And we had a very good time indeed with that. Natalie and Frank and David and some more of the neighbor children and I would skin cats on that. Now, if you don't know how to skin a cat, I'll tell you. You catch the bar with your hands, and then you swing yourself through your hands. It's something like, uh, well, something like turning a somersault. We had a style. Of course, we had a fence. The style, I remember, was painted red. It had about four steps, a platform, and the sides were enclosed. Then there was a rail on two sides. One was the side where the steps were. Of course, there was no rail. And the other side was left open so that you could get up there and mount the horse when you want to go horseback riding. Our barn was as big as a house, quite as big, I'm not exaggerating at all. It had uh, six stalls in it, 
And upstairs, there was a room for the coachman. But outside of our back door, there was a pulley. And you pulled on that, if you, and that rang the bell, bring the coachman to the house when you wanted him. Well, of course, we didn't have any coachman. We had some uh, slides. Children in that day didn't have, in Guam at least, didn't have any playground equipment in the world. I never had seen a real slide. But these slides were built from the loft down to where the livestock was kept. And you, the hay and cow and horse feed were stored in the loft and then they were just pushed down their stall and you didn't have to carry it to the animals. We had an orchard. The uh, house was, we had half block of land and the orchard was joined the front yard. There was a fence between them. We had peaches and pears and we had a, a privy that was close to the behind the orchard we had a cellar you could enter it from the house or you could go uh, out in the yard and come in from that it was we used it for storage it was cool down there and when mom didn't have ice she put her milk down there anything else she wanted to cool and people in Kwana were very much afraid of storms, and there was a great many people had cellars that they called storm houses. But we weren't afraid of storms. Uh, this shows you just how much afraid we were. We had some neighbors that had moved to Kwana from down on the coast close to Galveston, and one night there was a bad cloud and these Wilkerson's were terribly frightened so they came over to our house and asked mom and papa if they could go down into the um, storm house with them in the cellar and mom and papa went down there with them but they didn't take us they weren't afraid so they didn't wake us up the uh, storm area was in Oklahoma at Snyder, not too many far miles from us, and they did have a couple of bad cyclones, but we never had one. And Crowell, 20 minute miles to the south, had a disastrous cyclone, but Corona just didn't seem to be in the belt. We had a pig pen with a pig in it, <laughs> and Frank killed a pig. It was a hot day, and the Pig was uh, all kind of sweating or showing in some way how discomfortable he was. So Frank, Frank got a bucket, a big bucket, as big as he could carry, of cool water and dashed on to the pig and just the mess of cool water killed him. And hit him, it killed him. We had a hen house. <laughs> I'll never forget that. When I was going to my music lesson one time, I went out in the hen house to tell Mama goodbye. She was out there treating the hen house for mites, and I got mites on me. <coughs> Excuse me. When I got to the music lesson, the things were crawling, and I didn't tell the teacher what was the matter. I just kept fidgeting, in and I guess she thought I'd lost my mind. We had pretty trees, pretty for that part of the country, because there were very few trees there. We had roses, honeysuckle, and uh, tamarack. We called it cedar lemnum, and I went to lemnum before I found out that that wasn't the cedar lemnum. It's just a sort of a bush with a feathery leaf. David started to school and he got along just fine. <laughs> it was kind of funny one day, one of the neighbor boys, Anton, called. 
held up his hand when they were in the second grade, and Miss da Taylor, the teacher, said, "What is it on tone?" He said, "Miss Taylor, Miss Taylor, Dake Smith's got on two pairs of pants." Well, Dake Smith did have on two pairs of pants because it was cold, and Mama thought he needed to wrap it up. Now, Easter was a big thing with us. We always had an Easter egg hunt at the church. We didn't have one at home. But we always had new clothes. If I hadn't had a new dress and a new hat and new shoes at Easter, I, I believe it would have just broken my heart. So one Easter, I had a new dress. It was white with a red thread running through it to make a check, and it had a Gibson pleat, that's just a big broad pleat, on each shoulder, and a black patent leather belt. My hat was white chiffon on a wire frame with little forget-me-nots on it, and my stockings were black, and my slippers were black, and it poured down rain, and uh, my, I felt just terrible. I couldn't go to Sunday school and show my new fine clothes. Now, I guess Frank and David didn't care because I don't know if they paid attention to their clothes. Anyway, Papa got sorry for me, so he went out and hitched up the surrey, and he took me to the, the church so I could be seen, and when we got there, there wasn't a soul there but us. I was in the third grade, 10 years old, when we had a very, very great sorrow. We lost our baby brother. He was three years old. He died in November 1903, and it was something that we never got over. It was not too long from then that we went to Denison to celebrate Grandma and Grandpa Smith's golden wedding anniversary. That was uh, about the second real trip we'd had. See, we counted that trip to Fort Worth in the uh, wagon when we came back on the train as a wonderful trip, but this was better because we went and came back both on the train. Grandma and Grandpa lived with Uncle Will and Uncle Carl. I think that Uncle Will must have bought the house. It was a pretty nice red brick house, and his doctor office was on in the front room. He was a homopath doctor. He not only was a doctor, but he peddled his own pills. He had little white soft sugar pills, and when he prescribed, well, he just reached over in his desk and got some medicine and soaked those little pills in them and gave the bottle to his patient. And he did that till he was 94 years old. And he always had plenty of patience. He said when he was so old that he couldn't stand up that he sat there in his office and wrote enough prescriptions to support himself and his housekeeper. The Golden Wedding was a big celebration. Grandma and Grandpa belonged to Baptist Church, and they didn't think Mom would go to heaven because she didn't belong to Baptist Church. Pop wouldn't go either because she kept him from joining any church. He couldn't make up his mind not to join their church, and, and he couldn't make up his mind not to join Mama's church, and he didn't belong to any church until we were great big children. He finally joined the church with Mama. But I think the whole Baptist Church of Denison was invited to this uh, celebration. There were lots of pretty gifts. Now, across the hall from Uncle Will's office was the parlor. It had uh, real pretty furniture, and it was uh, they called horsehair furniture. But the frame is the wooden part of this parlor set was just very pretty. Mary Catherine, Uncle Will's only child, inherited that furniture. I'm sure it was right for it, but I know Uncle Will must have bought it. 
And Mary has had it done, done over and beautifully upholstered and had the woodwork furnished, and it's it's just a, something Cecily would love to have. Then there were two bedrooms that opened into this same hall, and behind that was a long room that was the dining room and living room. Grandma didn't like gas, so they burnt wood in this room, and it was in there that they had been Thanksgiving dinner. They celebrated their anniversary on Thanksgiving rather than on the date of the wedding because they were married on Thanksgiving Day. And this was in 1904. We had a turkey feast that day. We had two tables about the same size, one in each end of the dining and sitting room. And at one table sat Grandma and Grandpa and their children. Grandma and Grandpa had lost three children and they are buried here in uh, Fort Worth at Pioneer's List, a very old cemetery that has had no lot sold in it for over 60 years. Then there was Uncle Frank and uh, Uncle Carl, Uncle Will, Papa, and Grandma and Grandma and Aunt Lucia sat at that table. Then at the other table was the in-laws and the grandchildren. Then late in the afternoon, the house was decorated beautifully on chrysanthemums. This decoration was for us, of course, and for the reception that uh, came late in the afternoon when all the neighbors and all the Baptists came to the celebrate the wedding anniversary. Now, Grandma's golden uh, wedding ring had a story connected with it. Grandpa had been a gold digger somewhere, and it was not the rest of four, not uh, the gold rush of 49, because uh, they married, you see, in 54, and he'd already brought this gold back and had a ring made from gold that he dug. He uh, almost didn't get home with it. Uh, he and his partner were coming across the, a river, and they had what gold they had in sacks, and had it in the boat with them. The boat was upset, and they almost lost their lives, but the same way they saved themselves, and they saved some of the gold, not all of it, Grandpa just had enough to make Grandma's wedding ring, and he had some um, ear rings, horseshoe-shaped ear rings, made for his sister. That's one of the things that I do wish that I had somebody to tell me where he got the gold. I, I don't know whether it's California or not. I like this verse from... Walter de la Mare is from a little poem called Memory. He calls memory a strange deceiver. He says, who can trust her or believe her? What she hoards up with equal care, the poor and the trivial, the rich and the rare, yet flings away as wantonly gray fact and loveliest fantasy. And I wish I could remember some of these things that or seem important, but it's the little things that stayed with me. <laughs> Memory is a deceiver for me. It was about this time that I became a, a reader. I, I'm like a Philip Corey and this book of Somerset Morns, um, well, I'll think of the many, name of it in a minute. When I'm not trying to, I'll think of it and tell you what the name of it is. You'll know in here, of human bondage. That the, Philip Corey discovered the habit of reading. That was the, the uh, most delightful habit in the whole world, a refuge from the stress of life. and. 
That was true with all of us. All of our family liked to read. We'd gather around the dining table and where our wood, our coal stove, we had coal stove in the dining room after our supper. We had um, breakfast, lunch, and no dinner and supper. We didn't have any lunch. And that's the way they're bun coiling. And all the men came home, the small town, of course, and all the business and all the, the work was centered close in, and everybody came home, children came home from school. Most of them did to eat their lunch. And in the evenings, we'd sometimes uh, sit there and we took the good uh, youth companion and the ladies' home journal. Uh, uh, the ladies' home journal to me was just about equal to the Bible. Anything in the world that was said in the ladies' home journal was bound to be right. I tried to do just exactly what they said for me to. Then uh, sometimes we'd sit in Mom and Papa's bedroom because that's where the fireplace was. And we didn't have access to many books. There was a library in the school, but it was very small. Sometimes we bought books, but we managed some way to always have something to read, and they would read aloud to us before we were big enough to read to ourselves. We had a talker in Corona. And uh, well, I see them. Um, now, they are uh, traveling entertainments, so I guess you've heard of them. Uh, Chautauqua would stay for a week and have different programs, and the last them would be, uh, oh, somebody would come and sing, and then the next number would be maybe a lecture. And it was always in a tent. We didn't have any place big enough for them to meet. At the church, we'd have ice cream suppers. For 15 cents, they'd sell uh, a great big piece of homemade cake and homemade ice cream. That was to make money for the church. We had the old settlers' picnic to entertain us. Everybody in the country came to, uh, out in the country, to a picnic under the mesquite trees. Maybe there'd be a few um, huckberry trees to sit under. I'll never forget one time at one of these picnics, I was eating a red egg. It was an egg that Mama had pickled in uh, beet vinegar. And this woman came and she said, little girl, throw that egg away. It's something's wrong with it. You mustn't eat that. I didn't pay a bit of attention to her because I knew Mama fixed it and I knew it was all right. Now, at the school, uh, for our NRSS, we did something in our little crowd that I've never heard of any other children doing. We played church. They had had uh, Salvation Army in Quona. As I was saying, the Salvation Army came to Quona. And they wouldn't like it much if they knew what we did about, about the way we felt about them. We were used to protected meetings. If they had them in uh, tents in the summertime, like the old churches in town had them, that would be an evangelist and uh, a singer. And they would be entertained by the choral people and. They always had good crowds, and the children went. But this was something different. The costumes and the way that, I, I mean, uh, the uniforms of the Salvation Army and the way they went around among the audience, and it, uh, the congregation, we just thought that was entertainment. <laughs> So we had a Salvation Army at school. It was says we'd get out in one corner of the yard. Of course, the boys were on one side of the yard and the girls on the other. And we didn't let the boys have anything to do with it. We never 
we'd have sister, we'd have sister so and so, and we have sister so and so, and we use the real names of the Salvation Army people who were in Corona. And we sang and we prayed and we had tambourines. The tambourines were uh, tin boxes with buttons in them. We liked to walk stilts. Sometimes we had wooden stilts. They had a board at the bottom that moved it up the height that you want your, your foot to go. And then there was a strap to hold your foot in there. And some of those stilts were pretty high. Natalie had an accident with a stilt one day. She came with her shoes and stockings on because her mom didn't like her to go barefooted, but we liked to walk her stilts in our bare feet. So she took off her shoes and stockings and she fell. She skinned her leg and it hurt pretty bad. But she had to put her shoes and stockings on to go home and she was a little bit afraid her mama wouldn't like it. Now there was another kind of a stilt that was a little bit safer and easier to make too. It was made of tin cans with whole, two holes one on each side of the can at the top and you ran a string through there and the string was just uh, long enough for you to reach reach with just a good reaching distance. David had sort of an eye to business. He was going to raise squabs. Some that that station maybe the, the buoy, a town that she went through between Portland and Fort Worth, and they told fried the chicken at the station. And he thought it'd be a pretty good out if he had have some squabs fried, but of course he wasn't a very big boy and it didn't go very far. Then he decided to raise chickens. But he had an accident with his chickens. His, our incubator was round and it had, uh, a, I guess it must have had an alcohol lamp. It, we didn't have electricity at the time. It was some, something they burned in there. Anyhow, he put some papers on top of the incubator and that made it too hot and it killed all the little baby chickens before they had time to hatch. And that was the end of that. Mama had two experiences with Baker Hamill. Baker Hamill was the department store in Portland. See, in those little towns in those days, there was not such things as a department store. There was one for dry goods. They sold uh, wearing clothes, and shoes, and bedding, and things like that. And there was hardware and there was furniture, and you had to go to a different store for everything you bought, even your meat. Baker Hammer called Mama one day and asked her if um, she had an extra umbrella. She said she didn't know, and they told her, well, go look and see if she had one, because somebody had lost an umbrella in the store, and they were calling everybody who was there that day. Well, sure enough, Mama had their umbrella, and we laughed at her for stealing an umbrella. But it was just exactly like hers. Then, it wasn't too long from that same store, Papa got her bill for a skirt. Mama hadn't bought any skirt. She called them about it and they said, well, they didn't think she did. But um, somebody bought a skirt that day and the clerk neglected to put it on the books, so they decided the only thing they could do would be just call everybody had been in the store that day and find out who owed for the skirt. Mama didn't want us to be idle brains and idle hands so when vacation came and we didn't have very much to do she found something for us to do she had us to tack carpet rags 
I think she tore the strips. They were bad news water, just whatever kind of material she could find at the rags they were. And then we tacked them, two strips together, and with a certain kind of a stitch, just a sort of an X. And there was a lady in Portland, Mrs. Carl, who wove rag carpets, and they were real pretty too. I read in uh, good old days a magazine that I get for a Christmas present. The people used to sell those carpets. They have uh, a padding of straw. Then in, when they had house cleaning, they take up the carpet and wash it. And then the strips had to be sewed together to put back. Now, I can't remember that. I, I just remember that we helped make them. And I can remember that they weren't pretty. But at the time, I didn't think so. They weren't fine enough to make me think they were pretty. And another way she kept us busy was gathering black eyed peas. Somebody on the edge of corner about that place that Frank and I ran off to the Sunday. And Papa brought us home in the rain and put us to bed for running away, had planted a big patch of black-eyed peas, and they evidently didn't have any sale for them. They had too many peas, so they just let anybody who wanted peas to come pick them. So Mom took us up there, and we picked a good supply of black-eyed peas. Then she'd take us out to the, the creek, Rosebeck was our creek, it was the only water we had around there except that pond that I they rode on the one time it froze over. We got it wild plums. Wild plums make the best jelly you ever tasted. And they make good cobblers too. Of course we had a cow and plenty of cream and a warm wild plum cobbler with the fresh cream is about as good thing as you ever tasted. And sometimes if she wouldn't finish the jelly, she would just can the juice and through the winter she'd make the jelly she needed. She said that she made jelly for one glass at a time it was better. We helped with the house cleaning about twice a year, everybody that pretended to be anybody tore up their house to clean it. They took the carpets and rugs out on the, put them on the line and beat them, took the curtains all the way and washed and ironed them, wiped down the walls, and just did the, everything they could to get everything in the house clean. And we were big enough to do a little bit of that to help her. One thing she didn't make us do, though, was churn. She didn't like to churn when she was a child, and she remembered that. So she just didn't make her children churn. David and Frank had a pet fair dog. They went out to about as far as the Black Eyed Pea Patch was, and they carried a tub of water and pour it down the prairie dog hole and the little prairie dog run out for it to drown. Now you'd hear and read sometimes that owls, snakes, and prairie dogs live in the same hole, but they don't. The owls and the snakes do go into the prairie dog hole, but they don't go in there at the same time. The prairie dogs wouldn't stay in there with them. They drowned out this little dog, this little prairie dog, and brought it home with them. They named him Buddy Tucker, and he was a nuisance. He bit the boys, he chewed the curtains, he chewed the carpet, and finally he ran away and nobody cared. Their other pet was a Scottish collie named Colonel. He was a, a good pet. 
But he ran away and stayed a long time. And then finally one day he just came back and he stayed a while and he left for good. They were quite disappointed when that happened. Now I didn't have a pet, but a cat thought it, it was my pet. When I'd be washing dishes, the cat would come and rub against my legs. And I never did like cats. When I was a baby, I would get the cat down and lie on it and try to mash it. And I especially didn't like this cat because she had her kittens on my doll bed. In summertime, we had lots of watermelons. The watermelon wagon would come along and we'd go out and pick out one. Mama knew how to thump them and tell uh, which one was good. And sometimes they'd let you plug the melon and just cut about an inch square out and see what it looked like. And you could buy a good one for a nickel. We had a 4th of July celebration when I had a pretty new hat. And I, of course, I wanted to be dressed up to the, go out to the parade where everybody would be there and everybody could see me in my pretty new hat. So Mama let me wear it, but she didn't want me to get out of the bucket and run around bareheaded because she knew it blister. And she brought a bonnet with her. And when she thought I'd show the awful hat enough to suit me, she put the, gave me the bonnet to put on, put the hat in the uh, floor of the buggy, and we left the horse tied and walked around through the grounds where the, we're having the 4th of July celebration. And when it was time to go, we didn't want to walk back as far as quite a piece. So Mama told Frank to go and get the, drive back and pick us up. He did, but my hat was gone. Somebody had reached in the floor of the buggy and taken it. Well, that was a mile and a half, and it, uh, it, it cost a good deal to count the way we had money. So she made me a hat, and it was really very pretty, too. She embroidered it, and did nice handwork. And then it was put on, and she took it to a miller to have it finished. It was put on a wire frame, and lined with net, and had a blue bow, so I had another new hat. On my first silk dress, was white salmon silk, and oh, I was so proud of it. I had wanted silk dress for a long time, and Mama didn't think little girls had all the wear silk. And I think I was about 12 years old when she made this dress. It had a lace yoke, two kinds of lace whipped together, and then it had a pointed bertha. Uh, bertha is a sort of a, a low color that comes down below the yoke. I don't see them anymore. We visited some cousins up in Clarendon, some of Papa's cousins. There was uh, Cousin Dale and her family lived in Clarendon, and her sister, Cousin Murdy, lived in Silver City, New Mexico. They visited us, and we visited the uh, Clarendon people who we needed to get out to New Mexico. Now, their names were Smith. Their father was Papa's Uncle Star. And then there were some other cousins that visited Mama and Papa from far away. That is one other cousin. It was our cousin, Orpha Ellis. She had no brothers and sisters, and her mother, you see, was a smith. 
Now, Cousin Dale and Cousin Murdy's father was a congregational preacher, and I don't know anything about the parents of Cousin Orff or Cousin Clyde. Cousin Clyde was a musician and a piano tuner in Chicago. He and Cousin Orff were like brothers and sisters. They lived close together up in Illinois. My cousin Orpha was a milliner and she was an artist. She made pictures from chiffon. They were scenes. She made houses and trees and I don't know how she got the chiffon on there. I saw one of the pictures and it was really quite pretty the news. I just don't know how she made it. She had some of them displayed in the Chicago Art Institute. When they got together, they'd tell stories about when they all lived together up in Illinois. And they, used, they laughed about Papa when he was little. His mother sent him on an errand. He passed the house for a you know, I guess he just walked into the yard to see what he could see. Anyway, there was one babe, then her baby, and he put his nose up against the glass and watched her. She came to the window and she said, Come in, little boy, come on in, you can see better. And he certainly went running. Then another thing they laughed about him was that he was in a spelling line and the teacher was infuriated with something he, did, he said. In that day, there's spelling bees and spelling lines were very common. Sometimes children would stand up uh, against the wall and have their spelling, oral spelling every day. And they turned each other down, the one that was, if you missed a word, what was passed to the one next to you, and finally whoever spelled it could go up head of it up in the line until you finally got to the head and then you went to the foot. So this teacher came to him one and told her that she just was going to have to punish the grandma. She came to see grandma and told grandma that she just had to punish Lewis for what he'd done in the spelling line that day. And grandma said, well, she would if she'd tell her what he did. She said, well, he said something awful. And she said, uh, well, you'll have to tell me what he said before I punish him. I'll just have to know how bad it was. And the teacher said, she just couldn't say it. And the guy almost said, well, I can't do anything bad if you don't tell me. So finally the teacher said, well, he said, you quit that. You're squeezing the guts out of me. When we visited Cousin Dell and Clarence, and we like to look at a net she had hanging on the wall. It was supposed to be a fishing net that had just been dipped in the sea and brought up with whatever stuck to it. It had uh, seaweed and starfish and shells on it, and that was quite a sight to us because we never had seen anything like that. But the most exciting thing about going to see her was something that would thrill any child. And that was her, her husband, our cousin Frank, was in bed with the, his arm that had been shot by a train robber. Cousin Frank was the conductor on the Fort Worth and Denver passenger train from uh, Childress to uh, Trinidad, Colorado. And up in New Mexico, there was an outlaw called uh, Blackjack. And it just so happened he picked out Cousin Frank's train to stop to rob. Now, I believe he did not rob the passengers. I never heard of that. But he did rob the express car, the baggage car, and the mail. And the third time that happened, Cousin Frank said he was just dead enough about it. He's going to do something about it. So he, he had a gun. But Cousin Frank was a good man. He was a, a, a good church Christian man, and he, he really did, didn't want to shoot anybody. But when he, he said that uh, his mail clerk came, and he could see that his jaw had been shot nearly off, 
he was ready then to draw a gun on Jack, on Blackjack. He and Cousin Frank shot each other. Jack Blackjack was injured much more than Cousin Frank. They just left him right there by the side of the track where it happened. They took the train on in to Folsom, New Mexico. I don't know what they did about that uh, one that was hurt because they were on the sanitarium or a hospital until they got to Trinidad and that was for a distance. They had, they had some kind of uh, first aid they could render him. I think that he had to wear a plate in his jaw afterwards. Anyway, when they told the sheriff that Black Jack was there on the ground, shocked till he couldn't get away, the sheriff went out and sent out and got him. And there was a reward for, for uh, well, there were two rewards for Black Jack. One was the American Express Company, and the other was from the railroad. And the sheriff tried to collect those rewards. Gun Frank got both of them and it was uh, enough money for him to buy a ranch. Of course, the ranch didn't cost as much in that day as it does now, but it was a pretty, pretty nice sum. And there is a marker on the highway near Folsom, New Mexico, that shows where that happened. Now, that's not just a story that really happened. When Gun Frank retired as a conductor, well, in fact, Gun Frank got fired. He took the people for nothing, took them on the train, took his friends, and they would be what the railroad the workers call a white rat. To be a man sat along once to while spying on conductors that did that. And he, he did it once too often and lost his job, but he was reinstated in his later days so he could draw his pension. And there was a, when that happened, when he was pensioned, there was quite an article in the Houston paper about this affair with Jack, uh, Black Jack. Uh, he took us to Trinidad one time. Mama had a brother who lived on a farm, our Uncle Jack lived, lived on a farm near Clarendon. We would go and visit Gundell in, in Clarendon and Uncle Jack would come get us and go out and uh, we'd visit him. Uh, that is, we did it one time. Uncle Jack moved real often now. Usually farmers that moved in year after year were um, renters, but Uncle Jack owned his farm, but he'd sell it and move. He just seemed to like to move. So <laughs> after visiting him, <coughs> we got on the Cousin Frank train and he asked Mama where we were going, and she told him she was taking us up to uh, Goodnight to see the Buffalo. Mr. Goodnight, for whom the town was named, had a big ranch out there with the Buffalo, and she thought that we could just, it was just a very, very small town, that the ranch should be right in walking distance to the depot. We just go up there and see the buffalo. <coughs> um, Cousin Frank told her that couldn't be done, that the ranch was some way out and there'd be no way for us to get out there. And if we did get out there, the buffalo might be out in the pasture and we couldn't see them. That the best thing for her to do was just to come on and go up to Trinidad with him. So that's what we did, and it was really a trip for children who never had been anywhere, except to Fort Worth. Turned out not as big as Fort Worth, but it was certainly interesting. It's in the mountains, the uh, Santa Cristo Mountains. They had a, a foot range of uh, Rockies. First time we ever saw a mountain, and it was first time we ever stayed at a hotel. I think we must have been there one night, one day, maybe two nights. Anyway, Frank got one of his railroad friends, a 
engineer on one of those lines that went out to the mountains to take us out for the day. So we went to two uh, little mining towns out in the mountains. They were Tercio and Gomera, and, and that was really quite a trip for us. And when we got back to the end of his run, which was a few milestones from Forma, he gave Mama a little piece of paper with a Harrington written on it, and that was our ticket. The next conductor did what the white rat was watching out for, too. Mama belonged to two clubs, the Thursday Book Club, was at the time the uh, Lee Club in Portland, and it was, if you had them on rocks out of track, along to that club, it was a study club. And the other club was the embroidery club. That wasn't quite as highfalutin, but it was a group of women who met with their handwork. And for one of these clubs, I don't know which one it was now, she fixed what a nice uh, plate for their to, for, to serve for their tea when they met with her the night before the club met after we went to bed and got out of her way she bid she cooked two white cakes she was a good cake maker and it was lots to make the cake then because you had to beat the eggs just to a certain consistency and uh, of course your cake was made with butter they didn't think it was any good if you didn't make it with butter and the next day when the club was over and she was cleaning up she fixed the plate to send to a neighbor who was sick and she was horrified when she saw she had not cut her, even one of those cakes. She, she must have had plenty of heat to fill up the plate with that, that, uh, that uh, overlooking the cakes wasn't noticed. One time I was walking to school and a boy caught up with me. I'd gotten about I were there. This boy said, Alice, your mom was calling you when I came by your house. So I went back. Mama said she never would have done what she did if she had known that he was going to catch me. Tell me, she thought when she started calling me that I was in her distance. She wanted me to come back and hang up my gown. And as far as I know, I never went to school again and that hanged up my damn. The problem decided that it would be a good idea to tear up that big barn we had. And you would wonder why anybody would build such a big barn for in the city. Of course you've seen barns much bigger than houses in the country. But this place was built, the house in the barn, by a rancher. And I guess when he moved to town, he just wanted to bring two little livestock with him, and that's why he had such a big barn. Mom and Pop decided there was too much money and too much lumber tied up in that barn that they could, uh, with his six lots that they had, could build a rent house and help out the income. And that's what they did. And this is one of the times that I wish that uh, what that uh, Dale and Mayor called the uh, lack of memory coming when you need it. The uh, strange deceivers, what he said it was. I, I wish I could remember what we had instead of that barn after the house was built from the lumber in the barn i know we had a shed or something because we still had a horse and a cow and we had a buggy and a saddle and 
I know they just didn't sit out, but I have no recollection in this world of what son of Arden was built in the place of that big one. After um, the lot was taken to, for the rent house, the boys didn't have any place to play. That is, Mom Pope didn't have enough room because it wasn't very long till they sold the next lot to a, a Dr. Rigdon from Ohio, who was a vet retired veterinarian, came there and built his home. So she let the boys cut down all the trees in the orchard, and they could have the orchard for their playground. I went to my first picture show with a neighbor boy about the time that these things happened. And it was in the old courthouse where we went to when I was in the first grade to McKinley's uh, memorial service. 